Let's put our hands together. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When hope is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I decided I'm not good enough, cause you won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. You keep repeating promises to me. Whoa, now there's no stopping what you have said it till it. In 
And you picked up all my pieces, put me back together. You are the defender of my heart. And when I found I lost me, you know where I left me. You reintroduced me to your so much better your way and hallelujah great defender it's so much better
His name is Jesus. We thank you for the way. In His name is Jesus. Oh Lord, we thank you for the way. In His name is Jesus. Thank you for the way. In His name is Jesus. Our great defender, oh, we come back with the head of our enemy. Oh, yes, you do. You are always victorious, you can never lose, you always win, Lord. So that means we'll always win too. Yes, we claim the victory today. We claim the victory. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. And I. y'all guys two passages that we're going to open up with uh, really quickly. Uh, we can go to John chapter 3. This is the first passage we're going to look at, and then I'm going to show you the next passage. But John chapter 3, it says, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. That's such a, an eye-opening verse. And that's, that's from the words of John the Baptist. He said those, those great words. I want to go down now to uh, Psalm 34.3. And this is where we're going to get the title of our message today. Psalm 34, verse 3 says in the New King James Version, Oh, magnify. Now say that word out louder. Magnify the Lord with me. Come on, say it louder. Say magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Now, I brought a, a, a special prop with me this morning. This is straight from my office, all right? Um, you guys know what this is, magnifying glass? Anybody use a magnifying glass here still when you're reading? Yeah, some of the, the ladies in the back, yeah. Um, so a, a magnifying glass, um, I, I just use it as decoration in my office, but <laughs> what, it's, what it's basically designed and created for is that whatever it's pointed at or hovered over, it makes bigger. And everything else around it looks smaller, right? So the title of my message today, and I want to talk to you all on the topic of making God big. Making God big. Come on, tell your neighbor, say, make God big. 
in your life. Let's just bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you that your presence is already, God, here in this place. God, we, we, uh, we sense you. We feel you, God. We honor you. We glorify you in this place. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you open up our hearts to, to your word to this morning. I pray you open up our minds to understand what you're speaking to us. I pray against the enemy that wants to steal from us. God, I pray that this word will produce a great harvest in us. God, it will continue to speak to us, God, on having a, a true heart and pure heart of worship. In Jesus' name I pray, and everybody says, amen. So making God big. If we've all accepted Jesus, if we've accepted Jesus here, you have God living in you. But the question here today is, is God magnified in your life? How big is God in your life? That's what I want to ask y'all this morning. That's what I want to ask you to ask yourself is how big is God in my life? And I love the, the, the scripture that David brings because he says, oh, magnify, make God big in my life. Let us exalt his name together. You know, there's power, power when we worship God together. When we come to his house every week and, and lift up his name, like we just did a moment ago, wasn't it a great time, an awesome time in God's presence? Um, but we have to magnify him in our lives and make him bigger than anything else. See, this is the hard, hard thing to do is a, a lot of other things in our lives seem bigger than God. Our worries seem bigger. Our stress seems bigger. Our fears seem bigger. Our needs seem bigger, our wants, our desires seem bigger than God. Because those are the things that we're magnifying in our lives. But now we're talking about hearts of worship. That's what the series is called, right? Having a heart of worship. And um, to say something like John the Baptist said, where he says, he must become greater and greater. I must become less and less. And to say something like David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. To say something like that, it has to come from the heart. To live a life like that is to have a heart of worship, a true heart of worship. It starts in the heart. And I want to ask y'all, could it be that some of us can't magnify God in our lives like we should? And we can't break through in our praise and our worship because there's other things in our lives that we're magnifying. Could it be that we can't magnify God because truly deep down inside our hearts, we want to be magnified? We want the glory. We want the praise. We want people to look at us. We w want to be looked at great. Are y'all hearing me? And instead of putting that magnifying glass over God in our lives, we're putting it on our desires our needs, our fears. Are y'all getting this? So I'm saying this because I'm talking about making God big. And I have three questions today that I want to ask, that I want to get answered for us. Three questions uh, about this topic on, on magnifying God and making him big. So we're going to have to go down. Before we get into this, we're talking about the heart. So the first point I have, the first question is, why did Satan fall? Why did Satan fall? So most believers know this. Most believers know that Satan is an angel, but he's a fallen angel. And he fell from heaven. And a third of the angels followed him and became, he became the devil, Satan, and they became demons. So most believers do know that, but why, was, why is it that he fell from heaven? And I want to answer this question. I want to look at why he fell. And if we could use one word to describe why Satan fell, maybe the word pride might come to mind. And that's a good word. That's an accurate word. But another word I want to use to describe why Satan fell from heaven, it's another word, and it's the word worship. The reason Satan fell from heaven was because of worship. And we're going to talk about this today. If you want to go to Isaiah 14, this is going to be our main passage, uh, our first passage. Uh, Isaiah 14, 
uh, and starting in verse 12. Now, this is a, prof- a prophecy spoken to a king, but it's actually speaking to Lucifer, to the devil, to Satan. And we'll talk about that in the next passage as well. But Isaiah 14, verse 12, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. So we get it. He's talking to Satan, to Lucifer, the devil, the fallen angel. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart. Now notice that. He didn't say it aloud. He said it in his heart. And I'm going to come back to that phrase in a moment. But check out what he says. There's five things that he says he's going to do. And they, uh, I want you to notice the words that he uses and to see how, how similar they are. All right? I want you to get what, what, where Satan's heart is. We're talking about hearts of worship. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. All right? Those, it's talking about going higher. Heaven is higher. I will exalt my throne above the stars, stars are high, of God. And I will also sit on the mount, the mount is the highest point on a mountain, sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. North is always up on a map. Verse 14 says, I will ascend, again, above the heights of the clouds, clouds are high. I will be like, watch the word that he uses to describe God. I will be like the most high. He doesn't say I will be like the most loving. I will be like the most holy. The term he uses for God is I will be like the most high. Y'all get what, what, where Satan's heart was, where Lucifer's heart was? He wanted to be exalted. He wanted to be lifted up. He wanted to be looked at. And then this is what God says in verse 15. It says, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths, that's low, of the pit. See, Satan wanted to be like God. He wanted to be like the Most High and he wanted to be worshiped. And he wanted, people, he wanted all of heaven to notice him and to give him glory, and to give him praise, to give him worship. And uh, you may have heard this before, some of you, you may have not, but all of us were born with an Adamic nature. And what that means is that we were all born with a nature like Adam, Adam and Eve. We were all born like a, and that is an accurate statement, but I could actually take that statement a little further and say that we were actually all born See, Adam was not the original sinner. Satan was the original sinner, Lucifer. So I could go as far and say that all of us were actually born with a satanic nature. Isn't that encouraging this morning? Y'all came to church to hear the preacher tell you you're born with a satanic nature, right? You go home and your mom asks, what did you learn at church today? Oh, that I have a satanic nature. Right, But I'm telling you, so we were all born with a satanic nature, but that's why we have to be born again. And we're born, when we're born again, we're born again with a Christ-like nature. Are y'all getting this? We're, we're born like Christ. But you might think and say, Stephen, then why do I feel like I still have a satanic nature? And I'm here to tell you is because your, your, your new nature is like a newborn baby. It's not strong yet. You need to feed that thing, which is your spirit. You need to feed your spirit. You need to make your spirit grow bigger, right? Because that that old nature, he's big, he's strong, right? She's big, she's strong. She, uh, She wants to dominate your life, right? That spirit, the old nature, the soul, the flesh. So that's why we must be born again. Um. And I mentioned a moment ago that, we, that he must become greater and greater. We must become less and less. Here's what happens when you operate in your old nature. You become greater and greater. And God becomes less and less. This is why every morning when you wake up, you have to put that old nature to death. I like the way the Apostle Paul says it. He says, I have crucified my, 
passions and nailed them to the cross of Christ. That's what we have to do every morning because that old nature wants us to sin. That old nature wants to rule our lives. The enemy wants to rule our lives and he partners with our old nature. So this is why every morning we have to put on our new nature. Amen? Put on Christ Jesus. And um, we were born wanting to be lifted up, wanting to be recognized, wanting the credit, wanting to be successful so that people could look at us. Oh, I bet that guy makes a lot of money. Look at the kind of car he drives. Look at the kind of house he has. Why? Because of that nature. We want to be worshipped. We want to be praised. We want to be looked at. Are y'all understanding this? So, and it doesn't mean you have to be flashy. You could be the most quiet, shy person and yet still have a heart like this. Where the reason that you're motivated to success is for selfish gain or selfish ambition. So I want us to, I want us to understand this. And, and you might be asking, Stephen, why are you talking about this? We are talking about it's important to have a heart, a pure heart, and a pure heart of worship. But we will never have a pure heart of worship as long as our heart is all about us. And that's what it's about, all about following Jesus. It's not about us anymore. It's about him. It's about glorifying and praising and worshiping him because he's the only one who is deserving of our worship. He's the only one who's deserving of all the praise and all the glory and all the honor in the world. So Satan, if you notice this in scripture, he's always trying to point the conversation or attention on himself. Jesus was the opposite. And Jesus in scripture, he was always pointing the conversation or the attention on his father or on the Holy Spirit. If you notice when, when he would say, I do nothing unless I first see my father do it, right? And then people, people would tell him, man, these works that you're doing are great. And he says, even greater works. When the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to see even greater works. And so he, he, he's glorifying Others, but I want you to see something in John chapter 8 and verse 50 and also verse 54. This is Jesus' words. He says, And though I have no wish to glorify myself, God is going to glorify me. He is the true judge. Verse 54 says, Jesus answered, If I want glory for myself, it does not count. But it is my Father who will glorify me. So the more and more we become like Christ, the less and less we point the attention and focus on us. The less we do and we say to get the focus on us. And uh, it, it, it's amazing to me that Satan, this is, he wants to be worshipped. He wants to, the glory so bad that he even tried to get Jesus to worship him. I'm going to read it in, in Matthew chapter 4, if you want to look up on the screen. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 it says, next, the devil took him, talking about Jesus, to the peak of a very high mountain. Notice it's a very high mountain. Took him high. He's trying to tempt him. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He says, I will give it all to you if you will just kneel down and worship me. Isn't that amazing how Satan tries to get God tries to get Jesus to bow down and worship him. And I want you to know that he did, Satan did not just say, will you worship me? He says, will you kneel down? Because I want to tell you something. The reason he says, will you kneel down? Is because worship is always expressed. We talked about that in the first week of this series. Worship is always expressed, always and everybody here worships some, something or someone. That's the question. The question is not if, it's what or whom do you worship. So he tries to get Jesus to bow down to him. And this is, this is I, I mentioned this in the first week of this, this series as well. I have such a burden and, and a, a desire to see men worship God. It really is a deep, bur, a deep 
desire of mine to see men express their love to God here in, in his house. And um, I, I told y'all that a lot of times, uh, us as men, we could be a lot more reserved, right? Women are opposite. They'll express their love easier than men. Not every, all the women, but some of them. And um, right, right, ladies, or am, am I just saying, making this up? Or men have a harder time expressing, right? Y'all could say, it? yeah, a little bit, expressing their love. But I have this, this burden. The reason I do is because our children are watching us. The next generation is watching us. And, and, and children need to see that real men worship Jesus. Our sons, our daughters need to see that real man, what it, what it looks like for a real man to worship God, to express his love. The greatest example you could give to your children and your family is the example of expressing your love to God through worship. So I, ha I have this burden. I hope that people are going to begin to grasp this and um, begin to worship God from their hearts, to begin to worship God in spirit and in truth. And um, so state, Satan started out in the beginning. He wanted to be worshipped, right, for, when he was in heaven. In the middle, he tried to get Jesus to worship him. So if we fast forward all the way to the end of the book, there's some info that Revelation, the book of Revelation shows us, and we're going to read that right now. But not too much changes at the end, except that Satan gets what he wants. And we're going to read that in Revelation 13, verse 4. Revelation 13, verse 4. Tell your neighbor, say, this is good. Say, pay attention. Verse 4 says, so they worshipped the dragon. Now, who is the, the dragon? If you want to go to, it tells you in the, the chapter before, Revelation 12. Do you have it up there? Revelation 12, verse 9 says, um, it says they were, the, the, the great dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil. You could go back and read it. Didn't put it in the notes. But it tells you who the dragon is. Some people try to read too much into that. And they're like, who's the dragon? Is it China? Is it this? No, Satan. All right. It says it. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. Now, the beast is an extension of the dragon. He's an extension of Satan. Okay, so they worshiped the dragon. They worshiped, are you getting that? They worshiped the dragon. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? Now, that's interesting to me because if you read in the Old Testament, that's a song that they would sing to God. In Moses' day, his sister Miriam wrote this song, and the song goes, Who is like our God and who is able to make war with him? And they would chant it and they would praise God and they would sing to God this song. And in the end times, people are singing this song about Satan. And they're saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? But how does it ever get to this point? Have you ever wondered that? <laughs> I, know, I know when I used to read the end times or the book of Revelation when I was younger or my teenage years, I'm like, man, that's a long time from now. How does it even get to that point? That's weird. That's crazy. But I'm telling you, we're not too far off from this. And, uh, but how, how does it ever get to this point? Um, I, I, wanna, I want you to see this. But Satan's plan was, it is, and it will be always to steal worship from God. I want us to understand this, but how does it ever get to this point? I'm going to tell you. So if we go to Revelation, we're still in Revelation 13. Now let's just go all the way down to verse 16. All right, verse 16, it says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. The NLT translation actually says, um, I think y'all have it up there, it says he required, he required everyone. Now that, that's an interesting word to me. And like I mo mentioned a moment ago, five years ago, this seemed far-fetched to where they, they would require you to get a mark 
And check out, let's continue reading. It says, and that no one may buy or sell anything except the ones that receive that mark. That's crazy to me. You cannot buy anything or sell anything unless you ha- receive this required mark. Now, like I said, five years ago, this was far-fetched. Today, it's right at our doorstep. And I'm about to say something. Hopefully, it doesn't offend somebody in here, but um, I want you to, to understand me. I don't, do not want you to misinterpret what I'm about to say. All right? And um, right now, there's a lot of talk about the vaccine. And should I get a vaccine? Should I not get a vaccine? Should Christians get the vaccine? There's all this conversation about it. Uh, can you agree? I'm not here to tell you if you should get it or not. Um, I believe, I'm not an anti-vaxxer or anything like that. I believe every person should make, do their research and make an educated decision on what's best for you and your family concerning the vaccine. And I, don't, I, I believe that people should not be looked down upon who decide not to get it And people should not be looked down upon who decide to get this shot. Are y'all understanding that? However, with that being said, the way that they're going about you getting this vaccine, by demanding you and requiring you to get it, if you do not get it, you get fired from your job. If you do not get it, you cannot get on an airplane. You cannot travel. If you do not get it, you can't go to the gym. If you do not get it, you can't go to a restaurant. And that's what they're demanding. That's what they're pushing. That's their agenda. And all that is is a dress rehearsal for Revelation 13. Are you understanding that? Why? Because Satan has an agenda. And I'm not here to say... um, it's about what the government's doing or it's about what people in power are doing or even what it's even about what the devil is doing. My point is, is that people are being conditioned. I want you to understand this. I believe, because uh, let's, let's continue to read this real quick in verse um, 18. To put, put verse 18 up there. It says, wisdom is needed here. It does not say common sense is needed. Common sense would tell you, I don't want 666 on my forehead, right? (laughs) But it doesn't say that. It says wisdom is needed here. Why? Because wisdom will be needed in that day. You're going to have to make a decision of what's best for you and your family. People are going to be making decisions based on that. So what I'm saying is I believe people are going to be so conditioned to magnifying their fears, magnifying their needs, magnifying their wants, magnifying their desires, that many people are going to be deceived in this day. Many Christians. Remember, it says you cannot buy, you cannot sell. People are going to begin to panic. And if you are magnifying right now your fears, what makes you think you will not magnify your fears then? You understanding that? So, We cannot be conditioned to magnifying anything else other than magnifying God. We have to magnify God always in the good times, in the troubling times, in the bad times. We always have to magnify God. Look for a reason to magnify God. You will not have to look very hard. We're all breathing here today, right? So Satan will demand, though. He will demand that people worship him. It will be a requirement that people worship him. If you do not, you will be killed. See, I mentioned in week one that God commands us to worship him, but Satan demands, he will demand that people worship him. There's a difference because God commands us, which it requires obedience. It requires a free will. You have the freedom to choose to love God or not or to worship God or not. But in this day when Satan demands, there's no choice for people during that day. So, unless they want to be killed. See, so commands involve love. Demands involve control. 
So why am I saying this about Satan? You might be asking, well, Stephen, why are you talking about Satan? I didn't come to hear about Satan today at church. (laughs) Because his mission and his focus right now is to keep you from worshiping God. His desire has always been to steal worship from God. So that's his plan right now is to get you to to keep you from worshiping God. And uh, here's another thing. Satan speaks through fear. This is why news outlets, and they love to put stuff that scares you because it sells. Like, oh, wait, wait, what's going on? And you tune in. And that's the way Satan speaks. He speaks through fear. And if we, if he could get you to make your fear big, right, he could make, get you to make your God small. So why did Satan fall from heaven? He fell from heaven because he, was, he tried to steal worship from God. That's point number one. The second question is, so what did God do? What did God do? And if you don't, didn't know this already, Satan was not only an angel, but he was the worship leader in heaven. He, was, he, he would lead God's angels into worship. And I want to read this. Go, go to Isaiah, back to Isaiah 14. I want you to see this. Isaiah 14, verse 11. It says, um, <clears throat> Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the sound of your stringed instruments. Notice that. The sound of your stringed instruments. So he's talking about that Satan has stringed instruments in him. So let's go to a different verse. I want to show you all in Ezekiel uh, chapter 28, verse 11. Now, this is a lengthy passage. It's about uh, six verses. I want you to read it, though. I want you to, to stay with me, all right? Bump your neighbor, say, stay with us. Say, God's speaking to you. Ezekiel 28, verse 11. Now, again, this is talking to a king. In Isaiah 14, he's talking to the king of Babylon. In Ezekiel 28, the prophet's talking to uh, the king of Tyre. But they're addressing those kings, but they're really speaking to Lucifer, the spirit behind those kings. And I want to prove that to you. So verse 11 says, Moreover, the the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and beauty, and perfect in beauty. So either the king of Tyre, or either this is addressing Lucifer, or the king of Tyre was one good-looking dude. I don't believe he was, all right? It says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now that's funny, because this was 3,400 years after Eden. So he can't be talking to the king of Tyre, he's talking to Lucifer, because there was only four people in the Garden of Eden. That was Adam, Eve, God, and Satan. He says, you were, in the, you were in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. Notice that those are all stones that reflect light. Satan was, was created and designed to reflect the light of God. It says, the worksmanship of your timbrels. I want you to notice that word. And pipes. The worksmanship of your timbrels and pipes. What, what a, a timbrel is, another word that we could use for it today, is a tambourine. And then pipes is a wind instrument, like a, like a flute, a clarinet, something like that. Um, He's saying the worksmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. So he was not born, he was created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. See, so he's talking, a cherub is an angel, it's an archangel. I established you, you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, you became filled with violence from within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out. So Satan was, he he was thrown out of heaven, cast you out as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. 
So Satan was, was created with these built-in instruments inside of him. And he, in Isaiah 14, it says there were stringed instruments. In Ezekiel 28, it says there were um, timbrels and pipes, which is percussion instruments or uh, wind instruments. And every single instrument, I want you to understand this, is made up out of these three instruments. Either a percussion, that's, that's drums, that's cymbals, that's that, a triangle for crying out loud, right? Percussion, uh, wind instruments is a, a clarinet, flute, saxophone, all of those wind, it's something that you have to blow through. Um, and then stringed instruments is anything from a guitar, violin, bass, even a piano. If you ever see a grand piano, it plucks strings when you open it. Um, now a lot of stuff is electric nowadays, but all, of, all instruments fall into one of these three categories. So Satan had all of them built in him. But the Bible um, talks about three archangels. Like I said, cherub. The Bible talks about three archangels, only three. And one of them is Lucifer. The other two is Michael, the archangel, and Gabriel, the archangel. And all three of these were, had responsibility over three main components in the kingdom of God. I want you to understand this. So Michael was put in charge of, 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 in, in the kingdom of heaven of prayer. And anytime Michael is uh, mentioned in the Bible, he's answering a prayer. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel prays, and Michael comes and he answers his prayer. Anytime uh, Gabriel is mentioned, he, he, the, the second component, uh, first is prayer, the second is the word of God, the third is worship. Anytime Gabriel is mentioned, he's uh, speaking the word of God. He's the one that came to Mary, and he said that she was going to have a, a son, Jesus, he also spoke to Zechariah, John the Baptist's father. And then the third component is worship, and that's what Lucifer, Lucifer was the worship leader in heaven. Are you all understanding that? So anytime we have a church service, it involves, one, it involves all three of these components. We have worship, the word, and prayer. Anytime you have your daily personal time with God, it should, re, it should involve these three components. Worship, prayer, and the word. Amen? So, so Satan was, was, had these instruments built in, but I, what I want you to understand is you were created with these same built-in instruments. I'm not sure if y'all know that or not, but you were created and designed with these same instruments inside of you. Let's everybody, let's just clap and give God some praise, all right? So we clap our hands, we stomp our feet. Those are percussion instruments, right? And then we have um, these things, uh, these strings in our throats called vocal cords, right? And then we also have, if, there, if you ever hear a good singer, somebody will make the comment saying, hey, that person, that, that girl or that guy, they have some pipes on them, right? And, and so we have these, 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 the wind blows through our pipes and strums those vocal cords and out comes a sound, right? Come on, let's just give God some praise, amen? Isn't he good? Right, that's praise right there. That's worship. We're worshiping God. We're, we're, we have built in musical instruments and God designed us that way. God designed us that way. You were created with these same instruments inside of us. And uh, verse 16, I want to go back to that. And it says, the abundance of your trading. Now that's a business term. And what it means is that Satan was stealing worship from God. And I want you to understand that God did not cast him out because God was insecure about worship. He cast him out because he, God is the only one who's worthy to be worshiped. And Satan was trying to take some for himself. And through that stealing of worship, he began to have violence in his heart. He began to envy and hate God. And, I like, and God cast him down. And Jesus described this event and he said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. 
So the moment Satan had this in his heart, God dropped him like lightning. And um, this is what I want us to understand. So what did God do? This is the second point. What did God do? He created you. He created humans. And when God created you, he designed you to be a worshiper. Are y'all understanding that? This is why it's so important to not miss worship. Don't think of worship as, oh, that, that's, that's a few minutes for me to get there on time. No, if you, if you miss worship, you're not on time. <laughs> we should be excited to get there before the first song starts so that we could lift up God and we could worship him together because something powerful happens. And, and the, that's the second point. The third question I have is what do we do now? So why did Satan fall? He fell because he stole worship from God. Number two, what did God do? He created you and he designed you to be a worshiper. And number three, what do we do now? Every day we have a choice. Every day we have a choice of what will be magnified in our lives. And I want want you to understand something that praise and worship is not a time or a place. It is a lifestyle. You can't think of just praise and worship as the first 30 minutes of church on Sundays. No, you cannot think of it like that. Praise and worship is a lifestyle. And I want to, I want to read this passage that's amazing in 2 Chronicles verse 5. I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles 5 verse 13. If you want to look up on the screen, it says, The trumpeters and singers perform together in unison to praise and give thanks. That's what we talked about last week, giving thanks, gratitude. To praise and give thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and other instruments, they raise their voices and praise the Lord with these words. He is good. His faithful love endures forever. At that moment, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. This is so good. The priests could not even continue their service because of the cloud. For the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. That's what we should be experiencing here at church every week. We should be experiencing the glory and the presence of God like never before. But it takes you and me to magnify him in this place. Are y'all hearing me? It takes you and me for us to praise and lift up the name of God in this place with our, with our voices, with our beings, our, our instruments. That's why we do this. This is why we praise and worship God with musical instruments. It brings the, the, the presence and the glory of God in this place. And I want you to understand that whatever you magnify will manifest. If you magnify money, Greed will manifest. If you magnify the virus, fear will manifest. But if you magnify God, I'm telling you, miracles will manifest in your life. Miracles will happen. Yeah, we can give them some praise. There was this woman who shared her testimony that used to come here to church. And she said that one, one Sunday service during worship, she shared her testimony, and she said that during worship, she felt fire go all through her entire body. And she said that it was a burning sensation that she couldn't take it, but she was just there crying. And she had walked in this building with an illness, a dysfunction. I'm not sure exactly the, 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 what was wrong with her body, but it was something that she had been battling for a long time. But during praise and worship, she, she got this fiery sensation in her body. And by the time worship was over, she was completely healed from that dysfunction that she had in her body. Because I'm telling you, whatever you magnify, when you magnify God, you'll see miracles. That's just a byproduct. Because that's who God is. He comes and he, he makes us whole. He comes and he heals us. He comes and comforts us. He comes and gives, gives us peace. He comes and he blesses us when we're in his presence. So as I uh, close this, I know I'm, I'm going 
going a little long here, but uh, as I close out on this, I want y'all to see this, this verse in Genesis chapter one. So we're talking about what we do now. And as I wrap this message up and summarize it, I want us to look at Genesis chapter one. Now it's interesting because um, we can read it. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse two is kind of, it's kind of odd. It says, the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters. So verse two does not seem to go with verse one. And verse three is where it says, God says, let there be light. So it doesn't seem to go with verse three as well. So there's many theories about this second verse in Genesis one, verse two. And um, one of those theories that, that some Bible teachers or Bible scholars call it the gap theory, where there's a gap where, where God created the heavens and earth, but there was a gap which is why it was formless and, and void. And, and many Bible scholars believe this is when Satan was cast down to the earth. And, and which makes sense because it was formless, which that, that word means chaos. So there was chaos, there was, it was empty, there was emptiness, and there was darkness. All three things that Satan brings to a, an atmosphere. And so Satan is on this, is on, is on the earth at this time, and, and it's, it's, there's chaos, there's emptiness, there's, there's darkness, and God, I believe this is what God says. Then God says, I'm gonna take care of those three things. And the first thing he says is, let there be light. And then the darkness was dispersed and dispelled. And then the next thing he says, he says, you know what? I'm going to bring some order to this chaos. I'm going to bring form. And that's where he, he created the, the, the star, the sun and the moon and the stars. And he created day and night. And then he separated the sea from the land. And he brought order. He brought form to the earth. It was not formless any longer. And then the third thing he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill this emptiness. Even though there's form and there's light, it's still empty. So then he fills the earth with, with plants and vegetation and, and mountains and, and trees. And, and then he, he fills it with, uh, he creates living creatures and creates birds to sing and, and sea creatures and land animals. And he creates all these things and he fills it and he takes care of these three things. But there was still something else missing in creation. There was still something else that was missing. And I believe it went something like this. I believe that Lucifer was on the earth at this time. He saw everything that God was doing. And he says, God, he says, yeah, this is all great and all. The birds and the animals are cute. But who's going to give you praise? Who's going to give you honor, God? Who's going to give you glory and who's going to be your worship leader now, God? And I believe God at that moment is when he reached down to the ground and he picked up a handful of dirt and he squeezed it, he formed it, and he blew the breath of life into it. And he says that, that's going to be my new worship leader. And furthermore, Satan, not only is that my new worship leader, that is going to crush your head. But the problem is, Satan showed up and he deceived God's new worship leaders. And he told them the very same thing that he fell from heaven. He told them the same lie that he believed when he was in heaven. And he says, you could be just like God. And Adam and Eve, they believed it, they bought it. And chaos and darkness and emptiness came back into the world. But I'm here to tell y'all something that 2,000 years ago, God said again, let there be light. And that's when he sent his son Jesus into the world to take care of the chaos, to take care of the darkness, to take care of the emptiness. And that's why Jesus 
came to this earth. Amen. So at this moment, let's just bow our heads. Let's just close our eyes. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're speaking to us this morning. I thank you, God, that you're doing something in our hearts, Lord. God, I thank you that you're challenging people here, God, to go deeper, Lord. I thank you, God, that you're inspiring people here today, God, to trust you. I thank you, God, that you're, you're doing things in our hearts, Lord, that only you can do. And we just say, God, come. Come, Holy Spirit, and do what you want to do in our hearts. God, we're open, we're yielded, and we're desperate for you, God. And I pray, Lord God, that we, God, will begin to magnify you through our praise and through our worship, God. That we will begin to exalt you, God, and give you the glory and the praise, God, that only you deserve. God, that everything else in our lives will seem small because of how big you are in our lives, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And I want to give this invitation. If there's anybody in here, we always want to give this invitation. If there's anybody in here that says, Stephen, I need to receive Christ Jesus in my life as my Savior. If there's anybody in here, you could just bow your heads. You could close your eyes. And if that's you and say, Stephen, I need to receive Jesus in my life this morning. Or maybe you have at one point and then and maybe you stop following Jesus. But if you want to rededicate your life, you could at this moment. Just lift your hands. Is there anybody in here that says, I need Jesus? I want to receive Jesus. I see your hand. Amen. You can put it down. Anybody else? I see your hand back there. You can put it down. Anybody else that I need Jesus? I need to give my life back over to God. Amen. Praise God. At this moment, let's just pray this prayer together. And those of you who lifted up your hand, let's just pray this prayer from your heart. God is here. God sees you. God is listening to you. And maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you wish you did. You could just Pray this prayer from your heart. And everybody together, let's just say, Jesus, say thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood for me. I acknowledge you, Jesus, today as Savior of my soul. I acknowledge you today as Lord of my life. And I accept you in my life today to take full control, I willingly give you control. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to love you more, God. No turning back. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At this moment, let's just stand as we, as we uh, close out in prayer. Just right where you're at, you can lift up your hands. We're just going to take a couple more moments. We're just going to pray. We're going to worship. And in your own words, you can worship God. Some of you, you could just tell him thank you right now. Like we mentioned, worship is gratitude. You could tell him thank you, God. Thank you for everything you've brought me out of. Thank you for everything you've brought me into. Some of you, you could just express your love. Worship is expressing your love to God. And you could just tell him, God, I love you. God, I adore you. God, I worship you. There's no place I'd rather be but in your presence. And you could just express your love to him. Thank you, Lord God. Just in your own words. Some of you, you just need to call out to him. Some of you, you, you haven't broken through yet. And God is calling you to break through. This is where you have to press in. You got to say, God, I need you. God, come and fill me. God, come and change my heart. Come and give me a responsive heart, a tender heart. Come and give me the, a, a new mind, the mind of Christ. And you could just tell them that in your own words. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence, God. God, I pray, Lord, for every person here. I thank you, God, that you brought them here, God, not by accident, but, God, by divine purpose. I thank you, God, that you want to speak to every individual here. And I thank you, God, that you're speaking. You're speaking words that weren't even spoken over this microphone. You're speaking to our hearts, Lord. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you do what only you can do, God. Untangle things in our hearts 
God, that, that don't need to be there, Lord. I pray that you're giving people peace of mind. I pray that fear has to go in the name of Jesus. I pray that depression has to go in the name of Jesus. I pray any oppression from the devil has to go in the name of Jesus off of your people here today, God. And I pray, God, you're filling people with your spirit. You're filling people with your presence here, God, this morning. God, you're renewing spirits here this morning, God. And we thank you for, for hearts of worship today, Lord. God, as we leave here, let us leave here with a, a, a pure heart of worship, God. And let us carry that heart over to tomorrow morning, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and the rest of our weeks, God. And let us take that into our homes and our families and our workplaces and our schools. God, a heart of worship, a heart of love, God, for you. God, we, we believe this, God, and we speak it and we claim it over our lives today, God. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everybody says amen. Amen. Let's give them some praise, people.